I'm a full-time uh, production supervisor at a chemical plant, and then in my off time, I'm an outdoor photographer, and uh, like shooting outdoor photography as well as wildlife photography. Some people don't do both, I kind of like doing both. And then in my off time, from that, I raise uh, various species of grouse. There are mainly two types of aeration systems. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Grand Stay Hotels, featuring 35 hotels in eight states and growing. Every guest, every time with Grand Stay. More on the web at grandstayhospitality.com. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live Wide Open, telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. Welcome to Prairie Sportsman, I'm Brett Amundsen. We all love to be immersed in nature, seeing wildlife in their natural environments, but sometimes getting up close and personal with those animals can be a challenge. Thankfully, we have dedicated wildlife photographers who spend countless hours in the field, allowing us to look through their lenses into the unpredictable world of wild critters. I love being out in the fall, just, you know, everyone else is carrying a shotgun and I have a seven pound camera over my shoulder, you know, walking around with, you know, I feel more at home doing that. If you've ever read magazines from Pheasants Forever, Outdoor Life, Field and Stream, Outdoor News, or many other outdoor publications, you've probably seen one of Steve's photographs. I, it's something about, because I love being out in the fall in for hunting and I, it just, it's just something that just came natural. And it's actually what kind of got me a start. It was like, those are kind of my, my first pictures that ever got published. And then, but I love sitting out on a blind on a spring morning and taking duck pictures. I was always into photography, even when, when I was in high school or junior high, I had my first class years ago. I always wanted my hunting and fishing pictures to look like they were in a magazine. Hitting your target with a camera can be more difficult than with a shotgun. Yes, because it's like if the bird all of a sudden gets up this way, everything is different than it would be if it got up that way. You have a general mindset of minimum shutter speed of what you want, but it's just getting in tune and knowing exactly how to operate your camera under duress. It, it's as fast as you can uh, turn the buttons and it's, it becomes second nature. It, it's like when you first started doing it, you're always looking at it and which button. And after a while, it just becomes, you know exactly which ones to do. But don't, but don't get me wrong. Many a times you totally screw up. It's not, a, <laughs> and, and you think you did all good and you look at it and it's like, you just wrecked it. And it may be years before that happens again to where you miss, you know, you had the opportunity. So it's, it's, it can be frustrating. Luck plays a big role in hunting, and it can also play a big role in photography. One of the best ones that I've, it, and I think it's the hardest one I ever got was a, a covey of Huns flushing out of a ditch. And I was fortunate enough to actually see them on the ground and they didn't fly. And we were like right next to them and it's like, this never happens. And so you're, you're all ready for them and, and they actually got up and everything worked just like it's supposed to. It's like, it, I've, I've never even had an opportunity come close again. You cherish those moments because it doesn't happen often.
Steve's love of wild birds isn't just limited to taking their pictures. But it's kind of cool to see birds like this that, you, you know. Oh, yeah. When I was a kid, we raced homing pigeons. Then I, we raised other kinds of birds. So it's like I've always raised birds, and it's like I always had an interest. I raised grouse years ago, and, it, and i fortunate enough to have the time and energy to do it. So I, so I made a point uh, about four or five years ago to, to get back into raising different types of grouse. It's just something that relaxes me. Some people sit, sit and watch TV. I sit out in the backyard and watch my grouse and feed them. It's just it's something different. It's a lot of work, you know, sometimes I don't know why I do it, you know, especially in the summer when you're, you know, sleeping five hours a day because you have, you know, a whole basement full of baby chicks to take care of. But it's just, it's something to be said when you can walk out and listen to booming prairie chickens in your backyard. With all those birds right here, it'd be easy to make them all pose for the camera. And while he does take a few photos of them, he just likes having them around. I do take some for photography, but I, I have just as much pleasure in driving 200 miles to go take them on a wild lek as I do in my backyard, but it's just, it's just something that uh, just, it's just fun to do. Steve mainly raises prairie chickens, ruffed grouse, and spruce grouse, but also has some Hungarian partridge and pheasants. I'm always fascinated by native, native grouse. There's just something about native grouse, the browns, the, you know, the, the blacks, the, you know, they don't have to be all flashy like a rooster pheasant, but they're just fascinating to, to watch. And, you know, especially with the prairie chickens, you know, I have, I, I have to say I have quite the, the background in birds in my life, it's all my life. So it's just fascinating to think that how many there were and they're almost gone. <laughs> Steve started out with 80 prairie chickens, has given some of them to other breeders, and is now down to 40. And he says they'll replicate their natural behaviors while in captivity. Yep, they breed and boom and just just fine. They thrive on the the arguing of the males, and you know some some pens are big enough where there's multiple males, and they just they don't fight. They they quarrel. They they set up shop in their little areas, and they they're just starting to do that now. And then they uh, start arguing. Is it later on? And it's 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 fascinating because they're they're like gentlemen, you know. They they this is my spot over here. This is my spot. It's like you don't you don't come by, you know. And, and so they don't they're not like other things that just want to kill each other. They fight and they they're, they're, they have like their gentleman's agreement. And they'll run back to this area. It's just like in the wild. I mean, they they could be right off the lek and they won't display and they'll walk on and that's my spot. One of the biggest challenges of Steve's backyard menagerie is dealing with predation. He's lost numbers from all his populations, including his spruce grouse. I only had um, three of them right now. I had an owl problem this way. It's like, unfortunately, I can't keep them. The same with the rough grouse. It's like the owls can be brutal. It's like you, you learn a lesson. It's like, even though everything's perfect, it's like you try and be nice to the birds and be able to let them fly, you know, and it's, but they get up to the roof and then bird, you know, the owls are just ruthless. While measures can be taken to mitigate predation, Raising upland birds in general is not easy. And along the way, many people have expressed their doubts to Steve. They're like, you can't raise them. They, 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 you can't, nobody can raise grouse in captivity. You, you know, you can't do it. And pe people have been doing it for a hundred years. It's, you know, it's very much more difficult and, you know, hands-on and it, it will never be on a commercial scale, but it's, you know, but that's the first thing they tell you, you can't do, you can't do that. But I have a friend that, you know, that's, that's all he raises is grouse and, and he has grouse that are been alive for 15 years in captivity and you know they live a long time if they, they're a little different i mean they're a lot like people they're gonna get sick and you just like okay and you know you sometimes you have to nurse them back to health it's like and then they, they're just fine but you know it's the challenge to create your own fenced in flock of feathered friends you need to follow some regulations. I'm USDA inspected for my facilities every spring, so they come and check that out. And then I have a state game farm license to, to sell them. And usually, you know, I give a lot of birds away to local people in Minnesota. When Steve raises the prairie chickens, he actually takes the eggs from the birds, hatches them, and raises them himself. He's had so much success with it that researchers in South Texas have inquired about his methods for reintroduction of Atwater prairie chickens. They're the most endangered bird in North America. 
and uh, so they, they're they're doing some huge reintroductions of uh, captive birds to get the wild population going. And unfortunately, if it was not for the reintroduction of the captive birds, they'd be extinct now. I've been sharing my um, success in the way I re raise them, help, you know, some of the things I do different than what they do, and that's helped, you know, give them ideas on how to uh, do things a little different. Plus, I've learned a lot from what they do. It's been kind of a mutually beneficial thing. A lot of times they're hiding underneath their little thing here. They're really tame. Steve's birds are raised for reproduction or educational purposes. None of them end up at game farms or on the kitchen table. No, no. Delicious. No, they are delicious. It's like, no. But after, it's like after you, uh, you get used to them and you know, when you get chased out of your pen every morning because they come attack your feet, it's like, you know, they, they, they grow on you. My wife was never, never was around birds and it's like, I think I've converted her now. She loves her grouse. There's something about little grouse with a lot of attitude. They think they weigh 200 pounds and they're only a foot tall. You can tell a lot of them, even though they all look like they're the same, you can tell individuals. It's kind of funny. While the native grouse may be Steve's favorite, he has three that aren't that he's just as proud of. A pen that would, that would look like a zoo exhibit where it'd be totally, you know, it's, it's just nice and green. I mean, they just thrive in here. This, these are Cabot's tragopans. These are a very endangered species from China. These are, these are kind of unique pheasants. And these uh, nest elevated nests. Most pheasants nest on the ground. These actually nest up in the air. Really? It's still, they, they start laying eggs about the last week in March. Cool looking birds. But there's, I think they estimate the wild population is under 5,000. While many birds have their own unique beauty, there may be none more grand than the wood duck. We're blessed to have the amount of wood ducks that we have here, and, and it's like, you know, many times I'll have up to 50 of them right in the yard, and you can, it never gets old. I don't know, I have taken thousands of wood duck pictures, and it's like, I will continue to take thousands more, but I don't know why, but I just love it. It makes sense then, that they're the subject of his favorite image. It was, it was a, shot I shot right out in my backyard here um, about six or seven years ago and it actually probably started propelling my career a little bit it, and it was a, a Drake wood duck and it was with old gear it wasn't you know it was still night but it was old stuff and I got this perfect reflection of a Drake wood duck on a mirror the water was absolutely like glass and it, and I actually won the Ducks Unlimited photo contest with that. It's the prettiest picture I've ever taken. That it just, I just love it. I've always just been a wildlife and a bird nut. And you know, it's like, there's just something about uh, being outside and you know, a spring day, just, you know, sitting there, you know, with ducks at 10 feet, you know, in your backyard that don't know you're there. And it's always been a love for for wildlife. That's kind of a good read, a gauge. Once the levels get under two parts per million that you could start seeing the possibility of a winter kill occurring. Which of these aquatic plants is native to Minnesota and which is invasive? The answer is coming up right after this. As lakes freeze in the winter, they lose oxygen. In shallow lakes, that could lead to winter kill of fish and aquatic plants. Those years where you get heavy amounts of precipitation in the form of snow, essentially is like drawing the drapes on your windows and cutting off the light. Um, and, and that can be not necessarily snow either, it could just be really thick ice, so there's of course, biota, algae, plants, um, other critters that um, are using oxygen underneath this ice sheet. 
over time, especially as the winter goes along, you get more oxygen consumption than uh, creation. As a result, you run an oxygen deficit and, and creates those stressful times for fish and other biota, and in which case what we call a winter kill. To predict whether southwest Minnesota lakes are threatened with winter kill, DNR aeration expert Darrell Karstensen checks their oxygen levels. I come out and do, does all the oxygen checks. I drill my hole and then I check for ice thickness to, to see how thick the ice is in the area, which we're sitting here right now at about 10 and a half inches of ice. And then I also like to check the snow thickness, which is about two and a half inches of snow right now covering the ice. From there, we'll check the dissolved oxygen. And what we use is what we call a, is a dissolved oxygen meter. When you're doing dissolved oxygen readings, you're sitting here waiting, watching your screen, and you're waiting for about the levels to level out, and that will give you your reading. And right here today, I'm gonna say um, this lake here is at 15.28 uh, parts per million, or milligrams per liter. Um, which is a really good reading. You start seeing fish start to stress once levels get below three, and then once levels get below two, or even particularly more less than one part per million is when you start seeing your possibility of a winter kill. Winter kills are highly unpredictable, but that's kind of a good read, a gauge once the levels get under two parts per million that you could start seeing the possibility of a winter kill occurring. My job primarily uh, entails managing about 10 different counties, lakes in the area. Ideally, people want to catch sport fish, so it's really targeting uh, the big ones, the, the walleyes, northerns, perch, crappie, panfish of any species, really. In this area, um, we have some significant winter sometimes. If you have winter kill, uh, the fish tend to die, and then your population is starting over. So. Part of my job is, is trying to ensure longevity of fish populations in the area for anglers to catch fish. The concept of aeration is actually to create some a little bit of open water on the lake. And the idea is to get that atmospheric oxygen uh, water exchange so that it actually puts some oxygen into the lake. The general public is not anglers. Um, might be thinking that we're actually injecting oxygen into the lake. The reality is you don't have an oxygen tank sitting on the shoreline and, and being pumped into the lake. There are mainly two types of aeration systems uh, that are utilized. I'd categorize them as surface agitators and diffusers. Surface agitators are basically an electrical motor that's sitting on a flotation device. It's pulling up water that's warmer and just breaking the surface water tension so that it can't form ice. They basically just disturb the water uh, surface and keep that open water period. Uh, the system we have here behind me is uh, uh, a floating ice eater. We either use a chainsaw or we'll use an ice auger, uh, make several holes um, a, a, in a square shape, like this, the shape of the ice eaters. We'll uh, punch the ice through the, through the hole and uh, drop these things in. We'll take a couple cinder blocks usually um, to tie them off to keep the, the ice eater in place. And then uh, we run the cord up to shore, plug it in the box here. And uh, uh, once that's all completed, we put our thin ice signs up and we're done. The diffusers are actually a, a small pump that sits on shore. There are some solar systems, but uh, most of the time they're electrical and they just pump um, air through lines that go to essentially a a diffuser, it's basically a, a oxygen stone sitting at the bottom of the lake. And so the bubbles then rise to the surface, bringing the warm water in the bottom to the top, and then keeping that open water uh, on the surface of the lake. So as what you can see behind me is the system running, and then off to my left here, you can see the pump house, and inside there is what's where the air pump is, which would be very similar to like an air compressor. Um, it's pumping air, continually pumping air through lines that pushes the air out to the air stones, the diffuser system, helixers out in the water and causing the warm water to rise and to eat away your ice and then creating your open hole that you can see behind me right now. The idea is, is really not a lot different than just a, a, an aquarium in your house. Um, if you put a bubbler in the lake, uh, you create this refuge area 
for fish to survive through that bottleneck of winter where you might have really low oxygen at a, you know, a certain time frame. Um, and by having an aeration system, the, the idea was to create just a refuge time frame until open water. Um, and at that point, then oxygen levels start increasing again. Typically, what we see for our aeration systems, they're run usually from December through, uh, you know, towards the end of February. Um, at that point, we're really rounding the corner in terms of winter because you have much longer daylight. All aeration systems must have a permit from the DNR that is renewed annually. The permittee needs to sign with um, thin eye signs and they're reflective so they can also be seen in dark and they need to have it signed every 100 feet. Um, and then the corner is well defined. Justin Hoffman manages 14 aeration systems for Murray County. We go out weekly and uh, check oxygen levels in the lakes. Um, we go around, we monitor the systems that have been started. Um, yeah, do whatever we gotta do to, to make sure it's safe for everybody on the lake, everybody that's around the systems, and um, try to do our best to keep all the fish alive for the, for the anglers in the area. While aeration systems have been popular since the 1970s, they aren't necessarily the best option. Many are being phased out. We very rarely have any new applicants anymore. Um, if we do get a new applicant in, we look at the lake as a whole and say, will aeration truly benefit this system or is there other means of management that we can look at doing? I have uh, 53 different aeration systems installed in area lakes in my area. And um, they aren't necessarily the, the smoking gun in terms of preventing winter kill. We have used dissolved oxygen as a litmus test to predicting winter kill, but there are so many scenarios over the course of the years where you know you see that observation not play out in real time. Um, an example would be uh, you have a, a lake separated by a road, um, and you, one side of the lake has a really low dissolved oxygen level, and the other side does as well. Once the ice comes off in the spring, you have one lake that might take a substantial winter kill and the other side is happy as a lark. So there are other factors going on besides just oxygen as an indicator or predictor of winter kill in my opinion. Um, some different options that we use, like a boom bust fishery where we go in and we anticipate a winter kill and then we stock it heavily um, depending on what that lake group wants for fish and then um, within a few years that fisheries boom is a lot of our walleye rearing ponds that we use for walleye harvest in the fall took a significant winter kill back in 2014 and these last several years these have been one of our better fisheries that we've had it's just because we haven't had winter kill and we've had carryover and these have been great fisheries. When you have a winter kill come in on a lake you are potentially and hopefully removing those less desirable fish as your bullhead and your carp. And what the carp do is they, you know, they stir up the bottom of the lake and disturb your sediments and it leaves you with your stained brackish turbid water that we typically see down here in the southern part of the state. You know, winter kills in general isn't always a bad thing. You know, people see fish and they just think it's the end of the world, but you know, a partial winter kill on a system could be a good way to what we call nature's reset. Which of these aquatic plants is native to Minnesota and which is invasive? The invader is B, starry stonewort. How do we tell the invasive from the native stonewort? Native Nutella stonewort branchlets have forked tips of equal length. Starry stonewort branches are irregular and several inches longer than Nutella. Invasive stonewort produces star-shaped bubbles on clear threads. Why is it a problem? Starry stonewort produces dense mats at the water surface that can displace native aquatic plants. Where is starry stonewort found? The invasive plant is found in shallow, still water near public accesses. We can stop these invaders from infesting more lakes and streams by cleaning up everything we pull out of the water. It's a simple drill. Clean in, clean out. Before leaving a water access, clean your boat and water equipment. Remove and dispose of all plants and aquatic species in the trash. Remove drain plugs from your boat, drain bilge, live well, and bait containers, and keep them out when transporting your watercraft. Dispose of unwanted bait in the trash. 
If you have been in infested waters, also spray your boat with high pressure water. Rinse with very hot water. Dry for at least five days. Stop the spread of AIS. Funding for this segment was provided by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Wright, Meeker, Candiohi, Yellow Medicine, Laquaparle, and Big Stone Counties. for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Grand Stay Hotels featuring 35 hotels in eight states and growing. Every guest, every time with Grand Stay. More on the web at grandstayhospitality.com. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live Wide Open, telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. This pen, this, these are Cabot's trago pans. These are a very endangered species from China. Cabot's trago pans? Yep, C-A-B-O-T-S, Cabot's trago pans. What are you trying to get to there, bud? I don't think there's anything up there. But I always, I always wanted to raise these and, you know, and they were always a life dream. They were not very common back in, when I raised birds years ago. And they're, they're still not very common, but it's just something that I just knew that I would do well with them. And they like acorns. They, I, bring, I, I save a 55 gallon drum of acorns, so I bring them in here for their treats. Uh -huh.